Dr. Elizabeth Ratchford is going to be uh, talking to us about peripheral uh, artery disease. Dr. Ratchford is an associate professor of uh, medicine uh, here at Johns Hopkins, and she's the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for uh, Vascular Medicine. Um, her recent my bad. <laughs> well, another thing. The um, uh, research interest I, I uh, in peripheral artery disease, which she's going to talk about in exercise, and also I noted um, uh, she's been uh, working with cardiovascular disease prevention among firefighters, and some overlap uh, potentially with some other speakers uh, in our program uh, dealing with military astronauts and so forth that we talked about. So, welcome, Dr. Ratchford. Thanks so much for the invitation, and I have to say that last talk was amazing, and my mind is racing on how the eye and the blood vessels and the legs all overlap, and I think I need to change my after-visit summary and epic to add something about getting your eyes checked. Uh, so, so first, my disclosures. Um, first, I'm uh, not a cardiologist, but I do work in cardiology, and I work in vascular disease, but I'm not a vascular surgeon, and I uh, specialize in vascular medicine. So in case you haven't heard of vascular medicine, um, it's the non-invasive diagnosis and treatment of blood vessel problems. Uh, so if you think of cardiology and cardiac surgery and neurology and neurosurgery, you know, vascular medicine is complementary with vascular surgery. Um, and we see a lot of common conditions like PAD, which I'm going to talk about today, um, abdominal aortic aneurysm, thoracic aortic aneurysm, renal artery stenosis, Carotid disease, I run the vascular lab at Green Spring Station, so I read a lot of vascular ultrasound studies. I also have sort of become the go-to person for lower extremity edema, which is, you know, not the most exciting chief complaint, but I see a lot of it. Um, lymphedema, venous thromboembolic disease, so these are all the things that fall under vascular medicine. Less common things, fibromuscular dysplasia, erythromyalgia. But among all of these, uh, I have to say my favorite is, is PAD. And um, in the PAD world, my favorite topic is exercise, so I'm thrilled to be here today. So peripheral artery disease is the new name. Of, it used to be called peripheral vascular disease, but we don't use that term anymore because vascular refers to arteries and veins. Um, this is an artery issue. So the problem of PAD affects over 8 million Americans, and this, a lot of the prevalence data uh, comes from the partner study which looked at nearly 7,000 patients who were either over age 70 or older or age 50 to 69 with a history of diabetes or smoking. And when they looked at all, all comers who met those criteria, they found a prevalence of almost 30%. So this is, this is a, a major problem. And it's associated with decreased mobility and bad quality of life. And patients have been shown to have functional decline even if they're asymptomatic. And regardless of whether they have symptoms or not, they also have very high uh, cardiovas cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, most of which is due to uh, heart attack and stroke. So here you can see that the mortality of having PAD is worse than breast cancer, worse than Hodgkin's. The mortality rate is about almost 30% at five years and about 50% at 10 years. So the symptom of PAD, the most uh, common one would be intermittent claudication, which cl the word claudication comes from the Latin word claudicare, which means to limp. And this was named for the emperor Claudius, who actually died in his 30s. So he didn't live long enough to develop PAD, but he had cerebral palsy. So he, he walked with a limp, and that's where the word comes from. So in, in medical textbooks, you'll see that claudication is a muscle cramp or ache that's brought on by exercise and relieved with rest. And it usually occurs at a reproducible distance. So the patient will say, I can walk two blocks, and then I have to stop and rest, and, and then I can continue on. And this symptom of intermittent claudication, the symptom itself affects more than 10% of people over age 70, but there's obviously a lot more people who are e either asymptomatic. Okay, these slides just keep dancing themselves. <laughs> there's like some ghost here. Um, so most people have uh, actually no symptoms, but atypical symptoms are, are quite common. Uh, especially in women. So women get atypical chest pain. Women also have atypical leg pain with, with claudication. So this is diagnosed very easily by an ankle brachial index. You measure the higher of the two ankle pressures divided by the higher of the two arm pressures. And if the pressures are lower in the, in the ankles, you know you have blocked leg arteries. 
So once you've made that diagnosis and you figured out what's causing the symptoms, the medical management, this is kind of my, my whole uh, life in a nutshell. So my two goals are to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality and to improve quality of life. So I talked to the patients very clearly about this, that the medications that we're gonna give them and the, the thing, interventions we're gonna do, they fit into two boxes. They're either gonna make you live longer uh, or feel better. So the live longer box, in that we put aspirin, statins, ACE inhibitors, and, and all of those things are to prevent MI and stroke. Those three medications are kind of the mandatory treatment for atherosclerotic vascular disease. Um, and PAD is, is treated just like all the other uh, atherosclerosis manifestations, cerebrovascular disease and coronary artery disease. However, PAD patients are much less likely to receive optimal medical treatment in terms of antiplatelet therapy and uh, statins. So the, we have a lot of work to do in terms of improving the, the medical treatment. Uh, and then the, there goes that ghost again. Um, the second box is that feel better box. So there's only one medication approved by the FDA that is effective in, in treating intermittent claudication that's called cylostazole. And it doesn't really work that well and it has a ton of side effects. So there's not a lot of stuff in the feel better box. Um, there's another one, pentoxifilin or trental, which doesn't work at all. So the, among the things that we can do, exercise is the one thing that fits into both boxes. Um, and, and that is, is really exciting because there's actually something that the patient can do uh, to, to make them live longer and, and feel better at the same time. There aren't any studies looking at supervised exercise for PAD and mortality per se, but we do know obviously that if you exercise, you do live longer. So the evidence for uh, exercise in the treatment of intermittent claudication dates back to 1966. So this study uh, was done in Denmark and has, is often quoted, and the, this study was six months of unsupervised exercise. And in this study, they showed an improvement in pain-free pain walking time and maximum walking time. Uh, and those are the two things that we look at as endpoints in PAD uh, exercise studies. So there's the pain-free and the maximum. And th these are also what we look at clinically when we're um, talking to the patient. So how far can you walk before you have any kind of symptom at all? And then how, how far can you walk before you have to stop? So I, I used to work at Columbia in New York and we, we did everything in terms of blocks because in New York it's all about blocks. So we say, you know, how many blocks can you walk Actually, usually we'd ask it in Spanish, but, but uh, we say, uh, so how far can you walk? Um, and they, they say, well, I can walk two blocks, you know, before one block before I, I get like a pain and then, but then I can keep going uh, for another block. And that's what we follow clinically um, from visit to visit. And that, that's also what's, what's measured in, in the exercise studies. It can be pain-free walking uh, time or duration or distance, but there's a pain-free and there's a maximum. And the maximum is more reproducible. So that's usually the primary uh, endpoint in the studies. So over the past 52 years since that original Larson trial, there have been so many uh, randomized trials and meta-analyses, Cochrane reviews, using all kinds of different trial designs. Um, they've looked at supervised exercise versus unsupervised exercise. Supervised is better, because if I tell you that you need to exercise for half an hour a day, chances are you're not actually going to do it. So supervised programs uh, have improved adherence and are thus um, usually more effective. And symptomatic patients have been examined and asymptomatic patients, and even asymptomatic patients benefit. So in, in terms of the, the type of exercise that has been done in these studies, they've looked at treadmill, which is, is usually the, the most effective. The resistance training is also helpful, but not quite as much as, as the treadmill. Even arm cycling, uh, studies out of Minnesota, have shown that arm cycling is beneficial to make people walk farther, which I think is really cool from a science standpoint, um, because clearly there's something about exercise that is improving your blood vessel function so that even if you're doing your arms, your legs will work better. Clear, that's not as effective as the treadmill train, but it still does work. And the patients always say, well, can I bike? Because how, how, come, how come I can bike? I have patients who will say they can bike from here to the eastern shore, but they can't get their mail. So the reason for that is it's different muscle groups. So if you want to be able to walk farther, you need to walk. If you want to bike farther, you got to bike. Um, so, so that's, uh, but any, any kind of exercise, biking is still effective, just not as effective as the treadmill. And in terms of endpoints, we looked at, they, you can use treadmill testing, as I mentioned, and also the six-minute walk. Um, 
the Mary McDermott at Northwestern is the, feels the six minute walk is the best indicator because it, it translates more into, okay, that ghost is just, <laughs> um, the six minute walk is more uh, like real life, you know, compared to the treadmill. And there's kind of a training effect with the treadmill because if you're doing treadmill testing and you're doing treadmill training then and you're comparing them to a group not on the treadmill, then, then that might not be quite as accurate. So the six minute walk might represent real life better. There's also been studies looking at supervised exercise versus revascularization and supervised exercise versus revascularization versus both, uh, which is a really interesting concept. And I'm gonna talk about one of those. So no matter what study you look at, all of them, they improve pain-free walking time, maximum walking time, six minute walk, and a whole bunch of quality of life scores. Uh, and it, the magnitude of that benefit varies depending on you know, the duration and the intensity and the type of exercise, but overall um, it is extremely effective. And here's, here's just one uh, review. Uh, meta-analysis looking at 21 studies, and this slide is shown um, all the time, and this is uh, from 1995, but it, uh, you can basically expect a doubling of your maximum walking distance or duration. So if you live in New York and you're, you could walk two blocks before, now you can walk four blocks, which um, is a huge improvement for patients because then they can, you know, at least get to the next Starbucks. <laughs> so, um, so that, that was in 1995, and then let's fast forward to 2002. So this was when our own uh, Dr. Stewart published this, this review article, which is a, a landmark paper uh, in the New England Journal, which still kind of sets the standard for a lot of what's done in exercise training and claudication. Um, and and this, there's information in here about exercise prescription, and, and this is still uh, followed today, uh, and I, was actually one, I was not, I was at Columbia at that time, and then I came to Hopkins in 2007, but I was so excited to come here uh, when I was offered the job, in part because I knew that he was here and he had written this article and I couldn't wait to meet him. Um, so one of the things that's in this article is, is why does it work? You know, so this is uh, something that was talked about earlier and, and nobody really knows exactly why it works in PAD. It used to be that we thought there were more collaterals. And there are collaterals that form when a vessel occludes, for sure. So this, this isn't necessarily related to exercise training, but I can tell you that if you have a superficial femoral artery in the thigh, which is the main artery usually affected, um, and it closes, then there will be other arteries that form. You can see it on, on angiography. And I explain it to the patients that it's like if you shut down the main highway, uh, like 83, then at first it's a major problem because nobody can get downtown. But then over time, you know, people start using Falls Road or going the Beltway, and you know, there's a lot of different roads out there that they can take. And over time, they'll start to, to pave those roads and expand them. I was explaining that to one patient, and he said, well, they're not gonna pay to pave them in Baltimore City. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but this was at Green Spring. He's like, maybe in the county, uh, so. Um, but those roads, they get paved, and the, and the blood you know, starts to flow down those other pathways, and, and the patients can kind of understand that. And then I explained to them that if, after a while, people forget about 83. It doesn't even matter, because the, there's so many blood vessels um, and so many roads in the legs that it, they, at first they're very upset that their SFA is occluded, like completely closed up, but there's a lot of other blood vessels, and even if it occludes, you can still uh, eliminate your symptoms uh, by using all those back roads. So, but collaterals are not actually the answer to why exercise therapy works because uh, well, the ABI does not improve with exercise therapy. But there's a whole bunch of other great stuff that happens on a cellular level with exercise as was addressed earlier today. Uh, one of the things is endothelial function. So in vascular medicine, the answer is usually nitric oxide. <laughs> so um, that's uh, probably playing a role. Uh, obviously there's an improvement in the uh, blood pressure and lipids and all the other things that, that and sugar, all that we're gonna talk about later as well. Uh, but mostly it's improved oxygen extraction by the muscles. Uh, so that's what we, that's the sort of the most accepted theory. Um, you're, you're basically training those muscles to suck out the oxygen better is how I explain it to the patient. But it does have so many different effects and including weight, maintaining a normal weight is, is really critical. Because if you think of, if you're trying to walk and I give you a 25 pound backpack and you have to go upstairs, then it's hard. And then you take the backpack off and it's so much easier. So the uh, maintaining a normal weight is, is really important. 
So I'm going to talk briefly about CLEVER, um, which was a study looking at patients over age 40 with moderate to severe claudication due to aortoiliac disease. And we were uh, a site for the, the CLEVER trial, thanks to the infrastructure established by Dr. Stewart. And there were 111 patients at 29 centers. But this was the hardest study to recruit for. Um, it was mentioned earlier how difficult it can be to get people into exercise studies. But to get people into a study where you're being randomly assigned to exercise three times a week for six months versus a stent, that is a big difference in terms of the, the treatment. So some patients come in and they're like, okay, I know I don't want a stent. No matter what happens, I don't want a stent. And then some people come in and say, I've done all I can and I definitely want a stent. So you kind of have to, it's hard to, to have that. Uh, we did have equipoise because this had never been done before. So we could in good conscience say that, oh, we don't know which is gonna be better. And so we can randomly assign you, but the patients didn't necessarily agree with us. But 40% of the patients got a stent, 40% got supervised exercise. Originally, there was another group that got both uh, and that, that was an exploratory group which they had to eliminate due to low enrollment. And then 20% got optimal medical care without the exercise and without the stent. And everybody got the cytoloxazole, and they were followed for 18 months. And the primary endpoint was, as I mentioned, what we study is the maximum walking time. So that, that peak walking time was better in the exercise group. Um, both exercise and stenting were better than optimal medical care, but exercise did better uh, than stenting, which was really exciting for me as a non-invasive person. Um, and this was uh, durable at 18 months. The re results, of both exercise and stenting were still better than optimal medical care. So from this, we learned that supervised exercise better, was better than uh, stenting for treadmill walking performance. However, the quality of life scores were better in the stent group, which is, some, which is interesting. Um, so at that point, we also established the supervised exercise therapy uh, program at Hopkins. And EHP covered supervised exercise therapy from that point onward. So um, that, that was one of the best benefits of, of this, working on that study. And after that, the American Heart Association designated this as a level one, or, or class one level of evidence A recommendation for um, the treatment of PAD. And this is start, stop exercise. You walk till you get moderate pain, stop and rest until it goes away and then start walking again. This is the, the waveforms from a patient who has virtually no blood flow getting to her feet and she has no claudication symptoms because she exercises every day and she's done you know, an exercise program and, and her weight is normal. And this is, says to me that you know, this really works. Um, so that's all great, except if it's not covered by insurance, it's not gonna happen. So the uh, big, biggest news in the world of vascular medicine is that uh, recently, Medicare issued a national coverage decision, so they now cover supervised exercise therapy for uh, PAD. And that was based on the, the work of Alan Hirsch, who unfortunately died unexpectedly last year. Um, but he kind of did the science, and Josh Beckman did the politics. Uh, it kind of takes both to get stuff done. So this was, for, in the Society for Vascular Medicine, this was a, a really uh, exciting moment where two of these two past presidents really uh, pushed this forward to get uh, the coverage. So we now offer this at Hopkins, at the Clinical Exercise Center at Green Spring Station. It's also offered at Bayview. Luckily, we have the framework in place from the CLEVER trial. We've had these protocols. We've been doing this already, uh, but now Medicare patients can get it too. Um, and the first thing we had to do is get an order in EPIC because you can't do anything without that. Um, so there is now an order. So you just type in um, SET and it comes up or PAD and it, it will come up and then you can certify all the Medicare requirements. And these are the locations also at Howard County and Suburban. So we're all working together. Christina Marcus at Greenspring has been really instrumental in leading the charge and getting the uh, program off the ground. Um, and we've got some other stuff though that we have to, to deal with. So that was all great that, uh, that it covers supervised exercise, but uh, th there's a big problem because we need to improve access and reimbursement is horrendous. It's $13.03 per visit at this point. So it's, you know, no, that's not a big, there's not a big incentive for cardiac rehab programs to expand to cover PAD uh, rehab because the reimbursement is so low. We also need to figure out, you know, how, to, how does this fit into revascularization? They, they should definitely get it before, and it should probably get it after also, because it seems to be additive. 
um, and we need to standardize the protocols. So we need to figure out, you know, what's the best duration, the intensity, the frequency. There are some guidelines out there, but we need to track this and, and keep monitoring it. And this center may be a good opportunity, you know, for, for a, such a registry. Um, we need to also keep in mind the quality of life issue because it's not just about how far you can walk on the treadmill. Um, and then after, there's not a lot of long-term data, 18 months is, is a long time in this world, but uh, we need longer term data. And, and then how do the patients transition to home after the, the program? And I think one of the major uh, places in the future will be the role of wearable technology um, because that will minimize the use of resources. And that, that's a good segue into our next uh, speaker. 